I want to welcome everyone for this second GMBBM Frontiers webinar. This is um, the, the second one in the series. We had um, the, um, the first one of Viola Vogel about a month ago, and we have uh, about one per month planned for the next couple of months, so please join us again. Um, you can always find updates on, on Twitter. Follow the, the journal on Twitter, which is um, at MacBioMat on Twitter. That's a good way to find out when the next uh, webinar will be. Um, or you can email me. My name is uh, Marcus Bueller. I'm the editor in chief for JMBBM. And I'm um, very excited today to welcome um, really a great set of speakers to honor uh, John Curry's life and legacy. Um, and David Taylor has uh, kindly agreed to moderate the session and he has put together um, the, the program, the speakers, the topic, the framing. And uh, with that, I'll be handing it over to David. A few notes on uh, logistics. Feel free to um, put questions either in the chat or in the Q&A function. You find the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, or you can put in questions in the chat. Either way, we're going to be monitoring both. Um, I know that many of you are watching as well on YouTube live stream. If you are watching on YouTube, I'll, I will be monitoring YouTube, and I'll be passing the questions over to David so he has them as well. Um, we have um, about an hour, but I told all of them that we can actually go over, maybe longer if we want, and that's fine. I have a lot of time this morning reserved for this. Um, we're we're, we're going to go as long as we want. Um, David will keep an eye on the time. It's his judgment. But um, with that being said, um, I think all logistics are clear and excited to see you all and excited to see uh, a lot of people joining in. We're getting um, more people joining as we, as we speak, so um, that's really good news. So welcome all, and um, really great to have all of you here today. And with that, David, it's your floor. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, yes, great uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks to Marcus and to JMBBM for the initiative and then setting up this, uh, this series of talks. I'm sure, you know, we're all like me, we're all missing uh, the real uh, conferences. But uh, in the meantime, well, at least we can, we can look at each other and uh, have a bit of an experience like this. So, so, so that's great. And, Nice opportunity to celebrate uh, the work of uh, John Curry, who I'm sure many of you uh, knew. He was a great inspiration to me when I was starting off in this uh, work. Uh, you know, and I've realized looking back that you know, there was a group of people there who really kind of invented the topic of uh, biomechanics, which really didn't, didn't exist until they started. And a lot of those were people like John who came from that uh, biology background but had enough understanding of mathematics and physics that they could you know, make the step uh, into, uh, into biomechanics. I'm thinking of people like Julian Vincent, for example, and McNeil Alexander, uh, who, uh, you know, who really made big contributions in this field. And uh, I guess you know, uh, often you see in those cases that they were able to make a kind of a strategic collaboration uh, between a biologist and an engineer, okay, and and then then things happen, things work, you know, uh, and one of those uh, strategic collaborations, of course, was was Curry and Zupos, and we're very lucky to have the other half of that uh, that pair, uh, Peter Zupos here, to, like. to, to give the first talk. Hi, Peter. Uh, so, uh, Peter, I think you, you know you're going to get a, a, do a bit of a mix of of, of technical. Stuff, old work, new work, and and a few uh, uh, reminiscences about John and his and his way of doing things. So happy to hand over the microphone to you. Right. So I'm Peter Zupos. I'm from uh, Cranfield University in England. Well, start from this phrase, which um, I realize that comes from a from a gospel, a sort of a spiritual song, and it's from Ezekiel, the valley of the, of dead bones, them them dry bones, and um, and. Um, it's something I heard Kari mentioning once and I traced this and I found what the connection is. The thinking man there, I said, I don't know, it's a statue we have in Cranfield University. Um, I like it. It's not Rodin, it's something uh, more modernistic anyway. So it's Peter Jubus, the Mechanics Laboratory, Cranfield University in the UK. Right. How do we know John Kari? Well, I think those two things encapsulate him. Um, his love for the outdoors, he liked the peaks. He used to wear his trainers, uh, grab a stick um, and, and outdoor gear and, and, and climb some kind of peak somewhere here and there. The first weekend that I arrived in New York to work with him, incidentally, I only stayed with him six years in New York as a research fellow, so only six years. But I was told later that we published together 26 papers. So it was apparently, according to John, the most prolific period of his life. 
So only six years, but um, it marks you for life working with this, um, with this man. So we know him for his famous book, Bones, of course, John Curry. If you haven't bought it, just go and buy it, although it's out of print. I think, I don't know how many versions of this we've got now. Um, and the other one is his love for the outdoors. The first weekend I arrived there, he turned in my doorstep Sunday morning and said, right, get dressed, we're going. And he took me to the Yorkshire Moors and the Dales and all there, some forests. And um, he took me through my first paces in orienteering, right? Uh, I was shattered by the end of it. It was some experience anyway. That was John, John Curry. Um, right, um, now I can't help thinking, right? Because he was a father of bone biomechanics, basic bone biomechanics, if we can call it that, where does this start from? Well, it, biomechanics, it used to be called eathromechanics for those of you that you don't know. Eathro is from the, from the Greek for doctor, doctor mechanics. And that was back in the 16th, 15th century really with Andre Vesalius who wrote the, the Humani Corpus Fabrica, the fabric of the human body. That was when first um, scientists, and these guys were not simply scientists, Galileo Galilei was the other one, nearly contemporary of um, Andre Vesalius. Um, 16th century in Padova, same time, 1564 to 1643, he established the first chair of anatomy worldwide, Galileo Galilei. These guys were polymaths. They weren't just ma mathematicians, they were biologists, they were medics, the philosophers, the law. They started the whole thing. So they sort of deconsecrated the human body, we can call it, and the Holy Inquisition went, went after them at the time because they understood in terms of bones and sinuses and tendons and ligaments and what have you. It, it, it was a temple, but um, they took it apart. So they started the whole thing, frankly. Um, and there's people like them who make a mark throughout the centuries, you know what I mean? Um, and they define the field if you, if you would like to, to call it like that. So had, had, had John as a human being or as a sort of um, a, a person of some esteem arrived there? Well, his father was CEO apparently of a company in Corsham, which is Southwest England, not far away from Oxford. So in Oxford, he went to a grammar school, a private school, I'm not quite sure about this. Uh, he got a classical education, basically, as we call it in the UK. And he did a PhD then in Oxford as well. And then after the PhD, he boarded a whaling ship. Therefore, his love for whales and dolphins and all these aquatic mammals. Um, then he went to York as a young lecturer. When York University only started in 1969. So I think he was the first or the second in the Department of Biology. And he appointed everyone else after him. <laughs> so the Department of Biology in York at the moment is as big as a faculty. Is massive. And um, York, since 69, within, let's say, from 69 till now, climbed to the first 10, clearly, of the British universities. And it was to the work of, down to the work of John and the people he hired and the people who followed uh, of this achievement, really. Um, remarkable. Right. Well, I mean, to become something, I mean, you know, it's fate and purpose. Uh, nothing is predestined and, and things work out for you or some, some things don't work out for you. Uh, let's not sort of break any bones about it, as they say. Um, but the problem with, not the problem, the good thing about it, John and I were very argumentative, the two of us. We disagreed most of the time. And it was a very adversary sort of an argumentative relationship. And we, John used to have two secretaries that there was um, uh, sharing part-time 50-50 them um, supporting him. When me and you, John used to meet in his room, Peggy and Julie were sitting outside waiting, ready to call the 999. 999 in Britain, in the UK, is the emergency service, either for an ambulance or the police. Because we did scream and yell at each other, I kid you not. He had a liking for mineral content, I was in for the organic stuff, the collagen, and we went at each other's, you know, I mean, we, we really argued a lot. Um, and what was going on in our heads find itself on a paper. And the papers from this period reflect that, I think. And my, my advice then to the young is find someone you disagree with and work with them. Because that is going to produce the best papers that you can possibly have. Don't work with the people you agree with. Find the ones you don't agree with and work with them. So early influences in uh, John's life well, pearls, race horses, aquatic mammals, and everything else. He was a biologist. And um, after the PhD, and while he was a young lecturer in New York, um, 
he got a sabbatical to work with Rayleigh and Bernstein in America. So that's where he learned his engineering or whatever he needed, the materials testing part and the engineering parts of his, um, of his, um, of his profession. So he was a profound biologist, but he learned the basics. And, um, and then as a biologist, he used to gather these examples. So he worked with, uh, let me see if this works here. Oh yes, it does. Um, I have a tablet here and I should be able to make it work uh, as a laser pointer. Right, so he used to work with them, um, well vertebrae. In fact, I remember the, the time I was in York working in the lab and we got a call. A, a whale has been beached in Flabborough Head. Flabborough Head is one of the northeast uh, beaches uh, uh, near York. And the Coast Guard called him and said, um, we have a whale, it's beached, it's dead. Would you have an interest? So John got onto the Land Rover, picked up us and, and some chainsaws and made all the way to Flabborough Head to, to sort of meet with his whale. And when he arrived there, he stuck the chainsaw and the scalpels and everything to get out the tympanic bula from this animal. That's how you get by the samples. And then he collected vertebrae. One of these vertebrae, a single vertebrae, found its way to Rick Kruskis's lab. That was in 95, 96. And from this single specimen, because it's so massive, they cut out hundreds of samples. So John appreciated size. So something that big, which could produce the, that's a tympanic bula for a whale, would produce something that big is invaluable. So this was a mineral composite of 90% mineral. This was a massive cancellous bone bank. Um, what else did we work with? We worked on the narwhal, on the, uh, the monoceros, monodon, which is the, the tusk of this whale, which is a massive um, tooth, basically. It's made of dentin. So, and then years later, we worked on the rostrum of the whale, um, uh, mesoplodon densi rostris, a, min, a, a bone which is 98% mineral. So you can see by knowing biology and knowing what to find the, out of the ordinary, you had a good range of tissues to work with. And he did know his biology. So what was his PhD on? His PhD actually, one of the early influences was on, um, on uh, let's, let's do that. Uh, uh, his early work was, uh, PhD work was on the, on, the, on the bone of fibrolameral bone. So in his PhD, you will see drawings like that where he drew the growth of this from the groin surface and how these patterns came about. He, so basically he did a meticulous histological work of fibrolamera and uh, circumferential fibrolamera bone. And he described the patterns. How does this bone work on the periosteal surface? So that was his PhD work. And um, this knowledge followed him. And the next major influence was his, um, I won't call it obsession, obsession is a negative word. It was his, um, his um, attention that he paid on the effect of the mineral content, the mineral content on bones across species and um, across various bones, um, any kind of bone that you can make. So this ternary diagram, I think I used it once first in 1998. We borrowed this from Sidney Lisi's um, paper and we put all the bones we had in the lab. And you can see here that in fact, in nature, as the mineral goes into this biocomposite, water and collagen comes out or the relative proportion of the three sort of um, changes. So there is the rostrum, the cirrhosis. It's as it's as, it's as mineral or as, as ceramic as this uh, mug that I drink coffee, uh, a cup of coffee from. It's really very brittle and has really one or 2% of collagen, practically no water, a very dry bone. And then you can see that you have a well tympanibula there and everything else ending in antlers on that side, which, is, um, which is, has only 30 to 40% mineral weight per weight. So in nature, there's a trajectory there, right? And we are somewhere here in between him and Timor. So that is the broad spectrum, the whole panoply of bones in nature, that they were designed to do different things. And that's what um, John was grappling with all his life, collecting all this, freezers full of it, and looking at the properties. All these bones have been optimized for a mechanical, uh, for a mechanical function. There's no doubt about it. Um, and the point is why? What are they meant to do? What are they offering? Now, unfortunately, concentrating on the mineral, 
you fall into this um, trap. Uh, the radiologists and radiographers, and basically since the X-rays were de devised, used to call bone whatever they saw on the screen. But what, are they, what, the, what they saw in the screen was the shadow of the mineral. Bone is not just mineral. When it's osteoid, it's mostly organic. So basically, calling the shadow something of a white, a white shadow bone is not all of it. Um, it's not the, most of the story. So unfortunately, those that they think would see bone with X-ray eyes forget what bone is all about. So it shouldn't be. Uh, maybe the things you know, you know, are the things you should forget. And the things you don't know, you don't know, are the things you should go after. I don't know if I sound like Donald Rumsfeld, but um, <laughs> it is actually. That's what research is. Um, if you concentrate on the obvious, you miss the less obvious, which is what it really matters. So, I mean, we know about structure and function in bone, the micro scale to macro scale. Um, but what is the question? If we have all this um, intricacy and complexity, what is the question as Rick Huskis, Huskis used to, 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 if that is the answer that nature came up with, what is the question that the question is meant to answer? Right, okay, there's a friend of mine, Eriops. I borrowed this from some other lecture of another eminent person. Um, early transition amphibian lived 295 million years ago, emerged from the sea before the dinosaurs, a pre-dinosaur, let's call it. And for those of you anthropologists or um, anatomists among you, um, with a good knowledge of anatomy, you can name every single joint and bone of this body. So the question is then, pose the right question and you get more answers. That's, that's the story. If 20, 295 million years later, this template, what we call a skeleton, is still there. It's more or less the same. I can see ribs, I can see femurs, I can see the lot. Why is it so good? Well, in engineering, you know, if a design survives the test of time, it's a bloody good design. So why is this such a good design, right? We can argue this forever, maybe over a beer or a coffee, right? Well, it's more generic though, right? What is a skeleton? There's various skeletons. Let's take my dog out of it. So do these creatures and have skeletons? Does their balloon have a skeleton? They all do. It's what keeps them together. What keeps this organic phase separate from the environment? The environment can be air, can be gas, can be solid, can be water. And to prove the point, I've got there this one. That's what my dog would look like, I love dogs, in one of the gas giants of the universe, Jupiter, for instance. There wouldn't be a hard surface against which my skeleton will transfer my body, right? But it will be floating around but it has a skeleton, is the ropes and the canopy that keeps this together, right? So skeletons are something that you cannot do without, whether it's an exoskeleton or an endoskeleton. So the inescapable conclusion then is that skeletons, the primary function of these structures is mechanical. So it's a make or break or it's a life of death situation for most animals really. So where do we go from here if we were to pursue a research road? Well, what questions can we ask? ask? Well, the answer is th always thinking out of the box. And think of biological examples that defy wisdom, knowledge, and convention. So there's the answer I can, can answer. And that's where I joined the bad wagon. I joined the bad wagon uh, as a research fellow to study antlers with John. They went to physicist and engineering biology department and I was the man to uh, sort of bring some kind of maths into the equation. Now, why is um, antler so important? Well, John always used to sort of be proud of his hand waving uh, lectures and arguments. And um, he used to quote to Lewis Carroll, what uses a book without picture? Maybe there's an Oxford connection there as well. So there certainly is one. So here are some video clips now. For those of you that are not very familiar with bones or you don't know how bones work or um, um, function. So let's see now. I hope this plays. Oh, yes, yes. So we have a, a sample from bovine femur pulled in tension. And on the left, you can see the stress strain curve or the deflection curve. Um, can I play this twice? Maybe I can, yes. So you can see the load building up, the material yields or gives way and then breaks. And I will play this once more. 
Now look on the right on the specimen. I don't know if you can see here, if you can see the whitening here that appears. Can you see this? That's intense light and that's the whitening that appears when you pull bone aside, uh, apart. Now this is antler now. It says bovine tension, it should be antler. Let me see, no, no, that's still bovine tension. Let's go to the next one, antler intention. So look how different antler is, looks and behaves. Keeps on going. So what have we got here? We have a material that deflects by about 10, 12%, extraordinary, is mineralized. If you handle it, you say that's bone like anything else. There's nothing brittle about it. And even when it breaks, it breaks in ductile mode. That's tension and ductility, right? I'm not talking about compression or shear. It just tears itself apart, right? And this whitening is, is widespread throughout. So what is going on here? So let, let's look at the next one. What will happen if this take a bone and you make a small notch in it? Right, can I play it back? Maybe I can. I'll play it again then. So there's material with a small geometrical imperfection where it concentrates the stress. You can see the whitening at the head, ahead of the notch, but you can see that the curve, it's a glass curve. It has no yield at all. That is a bone that has been compromised. It could be a, an aging bone with a screw in it or an implant. It could be any bone which is somehow compromised. It, this is a, a mechanical compromise inflect, infected. Let's see antler now. You know, as I said, videos are fantastic. So let's see, does this play? Yeah, there is an um, antler with a bigger notch, if anything. There's nothing brittle about it. Even with such a big insult, because that's how you call this, it's a massive insult on the structure, right? The material antler does not break. I mean, who you would call this in engineering a damage tolerant material, right? You drill the massive hole in it and still doesn't fall apart. Now, what, what does this tell us then? That's why videos are good. Well, the whitening, it was sorted out a couple of years later. The whitening was nothing else but micro cracking, a widespread damage throughout the tissue. This, develop, this developing micro, crack, micro cracking rather, absorbed energy away from the notches and all these imperfections. So the, the more micro cracking that can be developed, the more tough the material is. Micro cracking appears in even in normal bovine bone. That's a bone with a little hole there, circular hole, which can be actually modeled and you can model these uh, uh, micro cracking bands. And it appears in antler, it looks very much different. It's more widespread and more heterogeneous. And even in dentin, here, this is the narwhal task dentin. It's basically tooth, the, de the, the, the dental, dentinal material of the tooth. Micro cracking appears anywhere. That is the major yielding mechanism for bones. So. There is something by looking into tough comp biocomposites, there is something, a very basic knowledge that derives, derives from basic biomechanics, the micro cracking and damage patterns for this material. So what can this observation and tools though address, right? We can see bone breaking, we can see the micro cracking developing, what can it address? Well, it may have something to tell us about aging fractures. This epidemiological data with age and gender you have an inc the incidence of, uh, of fractures um, in I have vertebral hip and wrist fractures there uh, increases dramatically with age after 50, 55. This could be COVID curves, mind you, but they're not, they're just um, hip fractures. So what else can you tell us? Well, what we need to address is the fact that also there is a strain rate effect in life. Bones in life do not break quasi-statically or because of creep, they, they break because most events in life are high strain rate impact, impact events or as a result of fatigue that, that reduces stress factors. So that's what life is about. But, but where do we start? I mean, how can we make sense of this? I know among the audience are some of you, some prominent sort of engineers. And 
I have be I have to be truthful and say that each one of us has a, his favorite pet method in a, in approaching fracturing materials. Um, but that is stale. It has to be a holistic approach. It has to be all of us together, everyone who is his pet theory, because that's what happens in, 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 in bone. This is one part of a specimen that broke. And what you see after it broke, you can see an area here where you had a, a, a stable slow crack growth. You see the stable crack growth and you see the pre-fracture micro cracking. And you can see these areas here, right? So have a stable crack growth, the unstable goes down. This is the after the growth of the micro of the of the macro crack, and this is the pre the pre linear fracture mechanics area. So it's three regions. It's a tail of three and four. It's a tail of three and four regions of behaviors. There's no point concentrating in just one of them because you can't tell the the, the full story. I will, I will stick my neck out as much as saying that I challenge anyone to give me by using any single theory or any two of them, a clear and equivocal answer why antler is so much tougher than bone, normal bone. You have to use the whole lot. You have to use the panoply of methods to describe this because that's where nature is so much better than any kind of man-made engineering design. It uses everything to achieve what they want to achieve. Nature wants to achieve. So what we did here, we have a number of papers there. Um, what we did here is that what we found really is this bulleted uh, sort of conclusions that the degree to which bone is brittle depends on the amount of damage it's able to sustain. This yielding, how long can you draw this yielding um, curve? How, how far can you go after the yield? The more the damage, the tougher the bone appears to be. Uh, the key to bone brittleness in particular and at high strain rates was the localization of the damage. So basically there is a fracture plane anyway. This fracture plane starts growing at some point. It's important that we delay its growth before it actually starts. And when it grows, it this fracture has to be stable naturally, like green stick, green stick fractures are stable, right? So what it matters is that the damage is specially distributed and it's not localized. And also, and also in time, in the time frame where, where it appears early or relatively late. So if that's what happens when you pull a simple stri strip of bone apart, localization is very critical, but it has to, that was the instinctive feeling. It has to do with stress relaxation effects. And that comes from the organic phase and the intricate heterogeneity of the material. So at that point, uh, I may have departed from John's sort of mentality a bit. And I thought oh, that's biophysical in its origin, right? And that happens at the nanoscale. It's not simply mineral. The mineral, it's the wood and the trees. The mineral is there and it's for everyone to see, but the very presence of the mineral affects the whole milieu of bone. And together with the organic, it creates something else. So one of the, of the tests that John used to love, and I know it's not widely ad adopted or universally adopted and used, is the Tattershall tapping, the work of fracture test. Um, the good thing about this test is this V notch that you, you grow into, the, into, you cut into the material. And this has the advantage that, um, let's change the ink a minute. That has the advantage that as the crack grows, the crack always grows from here, it meets an ever widening crack front that stabilizes the fracture, right? Now, I'll show you some effects of this in another video in a minute. But that is a test that John applied throughout his life in various materials, and he got some very interesting results. I mean, it just, tell, it just shows that depending on the tool you engage and how you use it, you can get absolutely nothing or very valuable conclusions. So using work of fracture tests now and, 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 and changing two parameters, changing the stroke rate, right? And applying it in different species, what do you get? Well, you get effects like that, that the test give you a material property for most of these materials. For most of what we call brittle bones, the Tattersall tapping test give you a, 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 a constant value. 
give or take with standard deviation or what have you. So basically, you change the, 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 the strain rate and the test give you the same value. So basically, it can produce what we call a material property. We would only call this a material property because it's a constant. But if you look at Ampler, probably, I don't want to mark up this term, so I'll change the, the thing again. Um, bear with me, but let's make it orange. If you look at the Ampler behavior, Ampler, which is what we know, it becomes tougher and tougher with the strain rate, orders of magnitude, one or two orders of magnitude, one and a half. So the, 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 the faster you load Adler, the faster you try to break this material, the more energy it absorbs. No wonder it accumulates all this energy, gathers, all, sorry, consumes all this energy. And no wonder the fracture is always so stable. And the stability of the fracture can be expressed with these numbers. I don't know if you see here, this is the number of samples that broke in a ductile or a brittle mode. So what do you see here? Let's see the conclusions. At low strain rates, quasi-static, up to walking speed, all bones, including human bone, cow bone, um, tiger femur, antler, they all break in this mode in a stable fashion and they produce material properties. However, start increasing the loading rate and you can see that becomes completely brittle. None of them brought in, broke in a ductile mode. None of them here in human and cow material. If I should have dentin here, dentin is very much similar to that one. And on the other side, deer antler, even at the most higher strain rates, completely ductile. So it's the qualitative and quantitative way that these materials behave, completely different. Now, you may be simplistic and say that's part of the mineral content. Antler has less mineral but it's not the full story, right? But clearly these materials have a decreasing mineral content from there to there, from top to bottom. This is a decreasing mineral content and this is the dramatic effect it produces. Okay, so what did, what did I do about it? I took human bone, um, a few samples, produced bins, a number of samples per, uh, per, uh, per strain rate, used four different strain rates, uh, put them into context. That would, would be, for instance, here, uh, impact and ontobotic conditions. Uh, that would be a simple fall. Um, that would be because I started, and that would be creep. Uh, you might ask, what, what would creep be in, in nature? Well, going to the supermarket and coming back home carrying your um, shopping bags. That would be a constant force applying over half an hour. That would be creep. But uh, really, uh, none of us experience a fracture in these conditions. So that's what we're interested about car crashes, impact and falls. So let's see then how human bone breaks in these conditions. Let's hope this plays. So the first of them is a 64 year old male from the femur. It's a beam with a several notch, 200 millimeters a second. Now the, the rate does not always tell you much. I would suggest that you concentrate on the on the time it takes to break this because, because of, of structural and size effects, the rate doesn't say much. So a big bone will require a bigger deformation rate to produce the same effect. A very small sample with a very small deflection will produce bigger strains. So basically that's something that happens within one to 10 milliseconds. Um, pulse duration uh, It's like lying on the road and a car rolling over you in a slower pace. No, so that's the first one, it's, sorry, that is the impact one. One to 10 milliseconds is a, it's an automotive car crash. So sorry, one to 10 milliseconds is an automotive car crash. When you crash your car and you hit the dashboard or your knees hit the dashboard, it's 10 milliseconds impact. And there is a, now let's stop this for a minute, if I can, no, I can't. I was a 75 year old, so it's 10 years older material. but a much slower rate. So this was a material which was 10 years older in life, 75, but in a slow motion and in a slow break over, let's say a second, it broke in a ductile mode. The previous one in, two, in uh, 10 milliseconds bro broke in a completely uh, brittle mode. Okay, what does this tell us? Well, let's put the whole thing together. Well, 
what have we got really that that collaborative, not collaborative, cooperative works towards the same message? We have the actual curves. So this is a ductile curve after the peak load. This is a semi-brittle curve. It's a curve where it turned from a ductile, oops, it turned from a ductile to a brittle mode half the way through the test. And those of you that have done fractography, you can see that in this um, in these um, curves as well. So there is advancing crack for front. That is a ductile throughout, a rough fracture surface. This is half the way rough and half the way flat. So slow crack growth, fast crack growth. So no matter what, either from the very effect on the fracture surface or from the curves, you can tell how the samples broke. If you didn't have one, you have the other. In forensic biomechanics, for instance, where we work in crime work and everything, because we haven't experienced the, the effect, we haven't got the <laughs> strains and, and loads of when, when the thing happens, we haven't recorded anything. You can tell for the fracture surface when the, 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 the fracture became unstable. So what do we get if you put the two things together? So there's a 3D diagram where you have the strain rate, you have the work of fracture values and the age of the individuals. So you see that there's a peak and before any of you object that uh, this peak shouldn't be there, I looked back in the literature and there is a number of studies. So I have McKelhany there, I have the uh, uh, Crown, Shield and, Crown Shield and Pope's and the Evans studies. So energy absorption in human bone and animal bones with a strain rate produce a peak before a decline. Okay, how are we doing with time? Excellent, right. So where does this tell us? Well, looking at the actual values of energy absorption tells you one story. There's a peak and a decline. And, know that, and we know that the work of fracture, the energy absorbed declines with age and declines with the strain rate. But what about the proportion of the samples that broke in a brittle, brittle or ductile mode? Well, if you put this into these logistics curves that you see here, you get this, um, they're equivalent to the AIS curves, AIS curves that you have in forensic biomechanics, the abbreviated injury score curves. Basically, they're stochastic. They express percentage of fracture. They express the chance of something fracturing. So that's a 50-50 level. There is the young, there is the old. And what do you see there? You see that between the young and the old, there is more than an, or, a, a, an order of magnitude difference. So the same effects that for the young Will appear, at strain, uh, will appear at strain rates that are more than an order of magnitude higher than the old. So when you play in the park and you are 70 year old and you fall flat in your face because you didn't catch the ball well, you are bound to have a fracture. When you are young, you can be tossed and thrown about or fall on your own will and nothing much will happen to you. You simply cross this threshold between safe and unsafe behavior. And this diagram in a nutshell puts three parameters together and brings into the equation this stochasticity, the, 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 that, that the chance of breaking something, it's much higher when you're old than if you're young. So I like talking about chances because it's, how should we put it? I think I have a, 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 slice about, a slide about this later on. So let's summarize some conclusions. Human femoral bone uh, shows a, a ductile to brittle transition. Uh, it has a maximum in the physiological strain rates, walking, let's say. Um, but this maximum shifts with age from the high to the low rate, right? It shifts with the, with the, with the strain rate and shifts, shifts with age. So the combined effect of these two factors will produce a more plausible explanation why aging human bones are more uh, brittle. It's not that the age is the strain rate as well, as well. Right, okay. Now, can we marry this with the biophysical effects we mentioned before, the localization or the threshold? Well, maybe we can. Clearly this has something to do with the organic phase because when we did uh, what we call this combined Zax wax uh, tests, and zap the bone with x-rays in a synchrotron source and observe them, the strains in the mineral and the collagen. 
you may have seen that uh, this before in various papers. Um, a number of people do this nowadays, measure the strain at the crystal uh, level and at the collagen uh, fiber level. Right? We get something like that. We did not simply look of these deformations while we were stretching the bone. We looked just after the bone samples were broken. So if you can imagine, uh, there is the bone sample in the vise and it's been uh, pulled apart, right? Let me draw it here. I hope that my drawing is not too sort of bad. So you ball, pull this bone apart. What will happen is it will break at some point. As you saw before, when the bone breaks, there's a deformation, there's a gap appearing there, naturally. Naturally, if there's a gap, that means that these two parts have been stretched. And what happens? It's the thing that no one looked before. This will recoil. So you have two pieces of bone, after the fracture happens, that they recoil, right? What will happen then exactly at that point? So what we did is we zapped bone exactly at that point to observe the crystal and the collagen structures and uh, strains at the point where the two bits of bone were recoiling back to the original dimensions. And surprise, surprise, there's your mineral, a linear elastic material, you relieve this, the load, the strain vanishes instantly and the collagen shows these relaxation curves, right? No surprise there. However, what was interesting is that you look at the relaxation rate of this collagen here, and you compare this with the effects that we examined before, the relaxation rate of these effects are similar to the relaxation rate that bone, when you deform it, crosses from ductile to brittle. We talked about ductile to brittle to ductile, transi ductile to brittle transition, and that after certain strain rate, every bone becomes brittle, except antler perhaps. The rate of that these effects happen is at the rate of just above running speed or at the rate that the collagen, the organic phase, stress relaxes inside the material. So how do we, I like drawing, let's say, how can we draw this? Okay, let's say we have a piece of material which has been um, uh, deformed in whatever way. And let's say that, um, oh, let's change the ink now to green. Let's say that a, a micro crack appears there somewhere in, 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 in this ma in unit material volume. As soon as it appears, energy will be released. Now, that will have a stress redistribution around this that will be felt with the speed of sound throughout the rest of the material will be transmitted through. So this vibration, well, acoustic emission will tell you this. If you stick an acoustic emission uh, sensor, you will hear the crack, uh, the crack uh, uh, releasing energy. The material, st the stresses around this crack will reorganize themselves, resettle. The speed by which this will happen depends on the organic phase, depends on the stress relaxation. So what this tells me is that all these micro cracks will happen. If the insult that we put on the material, the load rate is higher than the rate by which the material can stress relax and cope with the damage that was inflicted on it, this will become unstable. We'll have a damage localization there and that will go into an unsta a stable fracture. So really, the bone properties are more, more than density on mineral content. They're a fa factor of the loading environment. There's definitely a ductile to brittle transition effect in more or less everything except the miraculous antlers. That's due down to a localization, damage localization, which depends on the local conditions, right? It could be the, also, it could be the hydration of bone. If bone is dry or compromised in any other way, uh, input of fluoride, messing up the ions, the metal, the metal ions in the bone, or in any other way, temperature as well. This damage localization, this transition level at the point at which bone becomes from ductile to brittle will depend on any of this. It's really stochastic, right? So some people will experience a brittle fracture, some will not. But the basic origin of this is biophysical. And that's where I put this philosophical, if you don't mind me, I'm Greek, I like philosophy. I put this threesome of an analogy. We used to think of bone as solid. Solid bone is bone is an amalgamation or a, a table of five mechan mechanical properties. Then we thought of bone as fluid or bone is fluid because it changes in life in vivo. 
Well, I would like to think it as gas now. Gas means it's stochastic. It will do whatever it wants, depending on the conditions imposed upon it. So it's not neither solid or fluid, it's more or less gas. So something is certain in life is that bond never stays the same in the short term or the long term um, or under stress. Home <laughs> we call it homeostasis. Homeostasis is it's, 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 it's your favorite um, state of the, of the solid at any point in life. It can be anything. You can define homeostasis in, in different ways. And uh, the last is perhaps it's more important to do a lot of thinking in life than do a lot of doing. So grab a, a sort of your favorite theory and crank the handle and produce lots of data. Just think out of the box. And, um, and I think we'll have a, an interesting research um, discussion after that point. And uh, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, and a uh, very uh, interesting uh, talk. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, great, uh, great videos. You took all the risks uh, showing videos and, yes. uh, and sketching <laughs> as you went along, but we appreciated it because it really uh, livened up the, the, the topic. So uh, can I ask now, are there any, uh, any questions? Uh, please type your, your questions in if you have them. So yeah, I mean, so you're 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 developing through a, a, an idea there, Peter. As you say, that it's about the soft tissue, it's about you know the collagen and maybe the other uh, soft tissue elements and their time dependent behavior, uh, which I can I can certainly appreciate. It's going to affect the strain rate and all that. Uh, what is happening then? Do you think with with aging, is it that the the, the strain rates behavior what? of those of those soft tissues is changing, or what what's happening there? Well, I, well, I, I did a couple of um, research papers on this, uh, where I tried to pin it on the on the collagen unequivocally. Now it's the collagen. Uh, the collagen gets sick. I mean, think about it. The cells, our cells, do not function as well or regenerate our, um, ourselves after of 40, 50, 60 years old, right? My, our skin shows that, right? The wrinkles and all the rest. So the collagen will produce at 60 or 70 or 80. It's not the same collagen we produced at 20, 30, 40. So I thought, right, it's done all done to the collagen. It's a very elusive thing to prove that the collagen itself deteriorates that much with age. But I think it's a combination. The, the, the incipient damage that's torsion to the material of this cracks with light. The fact that the mineral itself gets um, doped with other metal ions, basically garbage in life. Fluoride is one of the various other metals go, you know, absorb it from the environment. Um, the association between the mineral and the collagen, plus the collagen cross links and the integrity of the collagen itself, all these factors together make aging bone more and more brittle. But um, right. it's not collagen alone. I, I, I'm prepared to concede that. Uh, and, and I thought it was an excellent point that that, uh, that you made there that, uh, you know, we're, we're all working with our own little theories and approaches and our own experimental techniques. And really, uh, we, we have to pull this together because uh, it's, uh, it's bigger than, uh, than anybody's particular idea. We're getting a couple of comments then uh, from Nick uh, Curry, uh, who remembers all the bones being in the freezer at home. Yes, all our, uh, all our families have to suffer from this. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, from, from Deepak Vashis there, thank you Deepak. Oh Deepak, uh, hi. He remembers the, the conversations in the pub and <laughs> that's very nice. Any other, any other questions or comments before we, uh, before we maybe move on? I'm under the impression that superior toughness of anthers compared to regular bone is mainly due to their higher content in collagen, less mineral. You seem to say that there is something else to explain toughness. Well, I think you'd agree uh, Peter, that it is to do with the, the yeah. larger amount of collagen, but it's uh, maybe just understanding really what that collagen does. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, we say higher or lower mineral content, but it's relative, right? So the relative ratio of the two contents is changing. So uh, as the mineral content goes up, the collagen content goes down. So in antler, it's the reverse. There's more collagen for the certain amount of mineral. So the ratio of the two, you can you can work on the ratio if you don't want to work in the absolute values of mineral content. Um, I have put forward a couple of suggestions like the higher heterogeneity. We don't see the collagen lamellae being stuck together as much, cemented together as much in a normal bone. There are two gaps in between them. They uncoil 
like a sort of um, a hose pipe, a reinforced hose pipe, as you pull it, they uncoil. I mean, that's another energy absorbing mechanism. But can we pin it down on this one? I don't think so. I don't want to be absolutist. I want to be open-minded and um, I'm open to every suggestions. I'm not here. You know, it's not my purpose in life to explain antlers. <laughs> Fergal O'Brien is, uh, is, oh, uh, uh, hi, hi. is asking what topics uh, you discussed on and off licensed premises. It's over here, but uh, I think he really wants to know what you and uh, uh, you and John uh, uh, most argued about, but I think it was the, the hard tissue, soft tissue, uh, yeah. or the mineral phase. Soft well, tissue. I mean, if you want anecdotal information, on arrival, the first day he took me down to Derwin College, I think, I think Derwin College in York, for a lunch. And over lunch, he explained to me, I have these things, he says, and my favorite sort of, I put my money on the mineral content. And I said to John, I said, John, have you thought of the organic phase? And he says, oh, rub, 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 rub. my dear man, rub, rub, rub. he ruffled his hair and everything, you know. And um, he says, rub, 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 you know. But uh, again, he's looking at it for a certain viewpoint. So after arguing with me for three, four, five, six years, we both decided it's a combination of both. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Um, That's fair enough. It is a composite material after all. It is, no exactly, one. exactly. Uh, I think I better uh, pull this to, to, to a close. Uh, there are one or two other uh, comments because the time is is getting on. So we have no uh, defined finishing time, but we obviously don't want to keep people uh, 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 for too long. So they know, uh, my, they know my email. They can email me if they have any. Obviously, absolutely, Peter. So, okay. so and and the you know the, the discussion goes on. So thanks a lot, Peter. We, we have two more uh, uh, shorter talks, and uh, the first of the well, I guess they're, they're, what we're trying to do now is to look at the. The different materials, apart from bone, uh, which John uh, worked on, and he worked on all kinds of things, uh, worked on insect cuticle, which we're not going to talk about today, that I appreciate it. But uh, uh, anyway, the, the, the next uh, material is, uh, is tooth material, and uh, I'm very, very uh, pleased to have Claudia uh, to talk about the work uh, that she uh, and, uh, and other collaborators did with John on, on, on the tooth materials. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll hand over now to you, uh, Claudia, if you'd like to show us your screen. And we'll... Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, in the beginning, David, Peter and Marcus, I think for organizing this webinar and for inviting me. And I would like to thank my colleagues who are named here. Um, and John was a major driver for this work that we performed on breaking crown dentine. John was part of our DFG grant where we looked at natural and artificial teeth. He said he was there to keep us on the straight and narrow, which was of course quite an understatement. Um, John inoculated us with understanding safety factors. He wrote, an obvious feature of safety factors in bones is that they are insufficient to prevent bones from breaking from time to time. So the engineer would say this is a fail safe concept in bones. But teeth are different to bones. They hardly ever break in vivo unless they have been treated by a dentist or um, <laughs> there's trauma. I'm allowed to say this, this was one of my collaborators, Paul Boslansky is a dentist and he always says this. So it's okay, I'm allowed. <laughs> and dentin has no ability to repair. And the recurring topic that John raised was um, what when cracks um, promote um, bone remodeling and he then repeatedly asked what are toughening mechanisms good for indenting and non-healing or non-repairing bony tissue. And the other question he asked is whether dentine is over-designed, that's meaning it is too strong for what it actually needs. Um, okay. We addressed this question by crushing whole teeth in the lab they were wet, cleaned pictures, fresh from the slaughterhouse. All in all, we tested um, for 55 teeth. So it didn't work, I think. So it works now. 54 teeth, um, second and fourth premolars from 15 adult sows. And they were tested under different conditions. We addressed this, uh, we further 
did this during quasi-static testing. We looked with digital image correlation. And here you see the development while the load increases. Um, and the first large strains are seen at the interface between the tooth and the bone. So the tooth is intruded into the bone socket. And the, um, at the beginning, homogeneous strain distribution on the crown shall becomes more and more inhomogeneous with a maximum near the load introduction site and um, um, maxima on the side of the crown. The intrusion of the teeth into the socket is also visible as a toe region in the force displacement curves. And this toe region goes up to loads of about 100 to 200 Newton. At higher loads exceeding this threshold, the curves exhibit a rather linear relationship between force and displacement. Many curves further show kinks, small load drops, um, or even plateaus in the force displacement curves. And according to our um, um, failure criterion, which, which was a 10% load drop, um, the, all the teeth um, sustained very high loads, up to um, thousand for the smaller teeth and up to yeah, several thousand, three thousand newtons for the bigger P4 teeth. And even teeth showing marked um, kinks in the force displacement curves, like these two, for example, um, which corresponds to significant fracture at intermediate loads, sustained extremely high fracture loads. And even though the P2 teeth are smaller than the P4 teeth and they generally sustain lower loads, this does not mean that they um, sustain lower stresses. It is a quite comforting result that all damage and failure loads are much higher than the typical chewing loads that are up to 500 newtons. This was measured for third premolars of pigs and similar values have been measured for humans. So this means that these teeth have a times five safety factor against catastrophic failure. This is in the upper range of values that John estimated for a variety of load carrying bones. We therefore conclude that teeth are very well adapted to survive single large overload events. Such overloads, however, should be very rare events for teeth, and they are further prevented by pain sensation and the reflex to open your mouth, mouth instantly. It might be surprising at first that these load were sustained by the teeth, even though most of them showed at least mild signs of wear. We will soon see this. Dome-like layered structures are, however, well built to resist loading, even in cases of moderate wear. And even though our premolars here are shovel-shaped, they are sufficiently similar to such domes and behave in a similar way. And here you see 3D reconstructions, volume reconstructions of micro CT data. And these show cracks in circumpalpal dentin here seen by the black arrows um, and most of the damage appears as shearing off as parts of the tooth often um, enamel with a little bit of dentin but also sometimes um, bigger parts of dentin and only about 30 percent of the tested teeth manifested damage that was visible by micro ct in dentin the other teeth only showed chipping off of enamel. And if the teeth are more heavily worn down and big parts of dentin are exposed, shown here, so these black lines, then we see crushing of the material below the anvil, often visible also by such an imprint. And we see big cracks and opening splitting of the tooth invariably in the mesiodistal orientation. The cracks in circumpalpal dentin are often diverted towards the DEJ or even outwards into enamel. This is definitely true 
for um, teeth where enamel protects dentine sufficiently. If this protection is lost due to extensive wear, then the cracks go straight down into the pulp and into the roots, and we have massive damage also in the roots. We see that the tip of the tooth breaks off. And as load increases, the teeth exhibited multiple cracking, like you see here in this tip, um, and basically crushing of the tip. And some of the teeth showed shattered volumes of enamel and dentin, and sometimes they also showed this tilting of the tip. We see very extensive, sometimes it doesn't work, okay, no, um, shattering with a multitude of cracks, like here. And this is in a volume that resembles a half sphere below the indenter. Further, we observed um, these very long longitudinal straight cracks. In this example, we see a crack that is wide and straight and open on one side of the tooth, on the mesial side, and very thin on the distal side. This crack developed, therefore, on the mesial side and advanced in distal and in apical direction. Concomitantly, dentine pieces are jammed into the crack opening, like you see here, for example. This presses the crack faces apart near the upper part, while chair deformation and banding take place. The split of pieces of enamel that are visible here may be the reason for tilting of the tip. We saw diagonal shear bands here, which was marked by the yellow arrows. And this was a very unexpected observation. These bands appear to originate from enamel on this side and propagate through dentin at an angle of about 45 degrees to the long axis of the tooth. Further, we saw that these two bands were actually one, they were connected. The magnified views here, these two, show that the bands consist of an array of cracks oriented orthogonal to the main band trajectory. The texture consists of segments of dentin that are separated by cracks at regular intervals of about 20 microns. And in some regions of the bands, we saw that the tubules appear to be clearly rotated with respect to the orientation in the adjacent non-fractured dentin. This offers proof that shearing took place. Shifting and torsion of the segments are therefore an energy dissipating mechanism, slowing the crack down and preventing catastrophic failure. To the best of our knowledge, such a mechanism has never been shown before for dentin. And the reason for this 20 micrometer bending is not clear so far. It may be perhaps the size of the tubules um, or in the incremental lines of the collagen fibers. Most cracks in circumpalpal dentine were rather straight. We observed typical toughening mechanisms like uncracked ligaments, which you see here, for example, um, but mainly at the end of such long cracks and also um, usually in the softer dentine on the outside and the softer dentine and more tough dentine of the roots. And the mechanisms observed most were crack diversion and multiple cracking, what you see here and here everywhere. The following sketch um, summarizes the failure cascade. In teeth with intact enamel, shown on the left-hand side, cracking of enamel and sub-DEJ soft dentine may initiate the crack in circumpalpal dentine here. Such cracks are often diverted. These are two different views from the side and from the front of the tooth. If extensive wear 
occurs, the cracks are directly in, initiated in the circumpalpal dentine and go straight down. In both cases, following the overload and once the crack has overcome the higher toughness of outer dentine, um, it rushes forward in a very brittle manner and through the lower toughness circumpalpal dentine. Then these longitudinal cracks are usually stopped because of additional cracking of enamel and sub-DEJ dentine, um, which continues to take place. And because the stress field changes due to the widening of the tooth towards the roots. And these interpretations are supported by further evaluation of the load displacement curves. Because the crack is running parallel to the loading direction, high loads are still supported. The smaller load kinks relate to further progression of the long crack, and the higher 10% load drop relates to further longitudinal crack opening and to crushing of the tooth tip. The very high forces and of sustained by the teeth and also keen questioning of John focused our attention on the still unresolved question of experimental determination of the stresses in dentin. If we normalize the forces by the area of the roots at the furcation, we see extremely low stress values in the range of 50 megapascal as a maximum. Further, we see that the curves are surprisingly similar and have show, do not show a lot of variation. And the point where we measured this is just above where the stresses are shed into bone. And this explains all this together, um, why it is often so difficult to drive cracks into the roots. And further, this value provides an estimate of the maximum stresses that can be dissipated into the jaw bone. Directly beneath the anvil, um, very high stresses are sustained, up to 1,000 megapascal. And they show also higher variation. And these values may give an estimate at which stresses natural teeth, which are a mix of enamel and dentine, start to break. So finally, um, coming back, to the safety factors that um, were John found so fascinating and important. Um, we ask again the questions whether dentin or teeth are over designed. Yes, we think they are over designed regarding strength and they are designed according to a safe life concept. Crack formation is avoided and there's a high quasi static safety factor and a lower but still sufficiently high fatigue safety factor. And why does dentine then need these toughening mechanisms? We assume this is to stop cracks from seldom extreme overload events from entering the roots and the pulp. Last but not least, I would like to share some memories of John. I will remember him always as a scientist who never lost his excitement about fracture and his devotion to get the science right, and as a very dedicated mentor for young scientists. Further, he had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, in one of his visits, he got stuck um, frequently in the S-Bahn, su which suffered from ice and snow in Berlin. And impressed by German engineering, he said several times, ja, ja, Vorsprung durch Technik. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved nature and inspiring discussions. We enjoyed this together with him and his wife, Gillian, um, during several walks and talks in the UK and in Brandenburg. And he never gave up his trust in my guiding capabilities even though several of these walks in Brandenburg ended up on kilometers of tarmac roads. <laughs> we lost a very good friend. We thank John very much for inspiring scientific exchange, his friendship, and for keeping us on the straight and narrow. And I will never forget how he said "Oh, several times, oh, come on, Claudia, when I did something that he didn't um, approve of that much.
And thank you very much for your attention. And th thank you, Claudia. That was excellent. Very interesting. Uh, nice new work and uh, uh, a nice connection there with, uh, uh, with John. Um, any uh, questions uh, coming in? Please, please put your questions in the, I, uh, in the chat there. If you, so um, you will tell me or? If you have any, yeah, no, I, 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 I'll, I'll keep an eye on the, on the question. So, I mean, this is what I found that has been, you know, it's very good that when, when one works with biologists because they keep kind of bringing you back to, uh, you know, why why is this in nature? What, you know, why is, yeah. has evolution led us to this point? And what is the, what are the structure for? What is the material for, you know? And you're saying that it's, it's over-designed and you mentioned, okay, that you would get occasional high impact uh, events, accidents, or, mm -hmm. or whatever, but still, you know, you have quite a few teeth in your head, so you can lose the odd tooth as an animal, and not really that that wouldn't even even matter. Yeah. Uh, right. I wonder, is it really that the tooth material is designed for another type of failure, which is wear? You know, just gradual wearing away from eating food that has grit in it and things like that, and that the, the strength is really just an incidental outcome. Yes. Actually, um, we also think so. Um, we are doing additional work in simulation, which was in a way also inspired by John's question whether dentine is over-designed and we tried to find values for stresses in dentine and didn't find them. So we made our own model. And now we modeled an artificially aged tooth, a digitally aged tooth, which um, has some wear at the tip and which has um, also um, thicker, um, cementum at the roots and we think uh, what the values the simulations show is that the, um, the wear changes um, the um, lever arm with which the tooth is tilted or bent and the roots the thicker roots stabilize it so all this together so the lower um, point of loading together with the changed lever arm and the thicker roots together um, protect the tooth from being overloaded. And in mm -hmm. a way, it's right. quite um, surprising that even these very worn teeth where the load is directly introduced into denting can sustain these extremely high loads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah right. so I think right. Right. Claudia. Yeah. Right. Very good. Uh, yes, Claudia. a couple more comments coming in. Uh, Michael was going to ask the same question yeah. that I did. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> it makes me think it wasn't such a bad question. Uh, and uh, uh, Claire Rimnack, who was just saying she, she met John a, a couple of times and was really yeah. uh, in, impressed uh, by him. him and, uh, and a few more well, yeah. uh, thank, thank yous coming in there, which is great. Peter, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I didn't quite get this. The size effect of these cracks that you mentioned, you know, the, the gap, is 20 microns or 200 microns? This banding, yeah, the, the banding of the, that's 20 microns. All right, okay. Yeah, you 20. Me, and, and John had nothing to say about this. Um, we actually only found this um, while we were preparing this paper. So we did the test with him and we did the microstructural evaluation later. Can I, can I, uh, can I share my screen with you a minute? Yes, sure, I stopped it. Right. Now, there is my screen. This is from a paper with John, actually. I think John was part of this in 1996. Um, let me see, let's share it now. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Look at the, ah, look at the scale yes. bar there. 20 microns, oh, wow, yeah. Right, when we were pulling apart the narwhal dentin samples, we observed something extraordinary. This material is a bowel composite, it's very tough, it's like antler, very yeah. unidirectional in layers, so much so that I thought, oh, there's an idea for a patent there, you know, if we could replicate this. And the other thing is, it is, oh, I can't make this anymore. Oh, I could, yes. That is the fiber angle, and yeah. there's the work under the curve. Completely insensitive, it's an isotropic composite, yeah. pulling it in a various angles, insensitive to the fiber angle. And we thought, my God, I mean, imagine if you have a, 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 a panel for, a, for, a, for the wing of a plane that's like that, right? And we couldn't explain this. So we looked in the microscopy, and I think I did that in Dundee, in a microscope, and that was explained. And then this is the growing, this is the, the pulp cavity of the bone, yeah. of, the, of the tooth. 
And these are called calcospherites. That's how a, a dentin mineralizes. So basically there are seeds in this organic matrix every so often. And from these seeds, the mineral crystals starts growing outwards till they are bat. So this is like an hexagonal pattern. And then the, the tooth, the dentin mineralizes. Well, this, the, the scale of this um, of these structures yeah. is so the whole like toughness it. of dentin is based on the fact that no matter how you twist it, you bend it, compression, tension, whatever, it will always break in shear between the calcospherites. Because these are balls held with mechanic in between. No matter what you do, they will go in between in shear, no matter what. So that makes it very tough, very stable, very ductile, and makes the micro cracking uh, this nice uh, pattern this pixelated pattern at about 20 microns, which is the growth of this uh, mineralizing uh, sphere. Yeah. The front, really. If there isn't one mineralizing front, there are tiny ones stuck together and they all grow in all yeah. dimensions, right? Yes. So, so it's, yeah, that's interesting. I think we should um, have a look at that. I'm not I tell you what, you send me, you send me, not your teeth, one of these teeth. <laughs> we'll polish yeah, yeah, yeah. it, we'll polish it. <laughs> And we look in the laser scanning confocal whether we can see these patterns. There you go. There's, yeah. some, there's <laughs> some more work for you both to do. Thank you, Peter. That's very, very useful. You. Greatly, you could you could pull that up. Oh, okay. Look. Uh, thanks. Thanks again, uh, Claudia. We'd better move on now to the uh, to our final uh, speaker. But that was, that was fascinating. Um, so the last uh, talk is going to be from Jen Yin, and uh, this is another material which John did uh, pioneering work on, which is NACA. Uh, and at the time when John was doing it, it was kind of pretty, pretty unusual to bother looking at stuff in seashells, I think. But since then, it has really blossomed as a, as a topic. And certainly in the last decade or so, there's been a huge amount of work done, uh, especially in the, in the sense of making uh, you know, biomimetic materials based on this NACA structure because of its uh, very unusual toughness. So uh, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, Jen to uh, to uh, uh, take us through some of the work that, that he's done uh, uh, in this area. So I'll uh, I'll hand it over uh, now to you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, hello, I'm Jen. Uh, I'm currently working uh, at Max Planck Institute, and I was the PhD student uh, of Professor Francois Basilat. And uh, I would like to thank Professor Basrat and Professor Taylor and Professor Bueller for giving me this opportunity to share some, some of my PhD work on maker in spite transparent materials and uh, to celebrate the life and the work of Professor John Curry. So, uh, so Professor Curry's like, last work on maker in 1970s, uh, it was actually uh, one of the first papers I was reading when I started my PhD. And uh, his work shows that uh, uh, nacre is a very superior structure that can have combinations of uh, stiffness, strength, and uh, toughness. So uh, here are two types of uh, uh, two types of uh, nacre structures I redraw from uh, uh, Professor Curry's uh, papers, and uh, this those structures inspired and influenced my work quite a lot. Uh, and uh, so the uh, so the primary like work in my PhD is trying to overcome the brittleness of glass, as we know that glass is a very important engineering material that has been widely used, widely used in many applications. But uh, the problem is that like, glass is very brittle, and uh, they usually they are usually the weakest components in those applications. So conventionally, there are two ways to enhance the mechanical performance of glass, and the first one is tempered glass, where we improve the strength of glass uh, through uh, thermal or chemical tempering. But, and the other uh, method is laminated glass, where we use uh, polymer interlayers to hold the glass fragment together upon fracture. But the problem is that uh, not, neither of these methods actually change the brittleness of glass, and glass is still brittle. So we might need some new ways to uh, uh, overcome the brittleness and improve the performance of glass while maintaining the high transparency of glass. And uh, so uh, it is quite interesting that uh, uh, many biological materials, they are very tough materials. 
and but they are actually made of uh, a brittle constituents and very weak proteins. For example, and uh, the roots of their amplification and toughness actually comes from their uh, very well organized and well well designed uh, micro microstructures. For example, we can find those very well organized uh, brick and mortar structures in nature, and uh, also cosplay structures in uh, the inner tooth enamel and also fish scales, and those like twisted plywood structures, which are also called polygon structures in the mantis shrimp club. So it will be interesting to implement those microstructures in a de to design new bio-inspired architectural materials that can combine uh, you know, mechanically dissimilar uh, materials into, in, into a very well-organized and well-designed architectures to, have, uh, to, to improve the toughness. So the question is that uh, how can we uh, improve, uh, how can we implement those microstructures and uh, to duplicate the structure and uh, the mechanism in those biological materials. So in our work, uh, we use uh, 3D laser engraving to carve the weak interfaces in, within glass so that the uh, bio-inspired architectures can be formed by those weak interfaces. And we laminated those uh, uh, engraved glass sheets together to form a 3D architectures. And the advantage of this uh, technique is that it can produce highly controlled architectures uh, with high precision, uh, we, can, we can freely control the geometry and the, the overall arrangement of all the building blocks. And another important factor is that we need to choose the right interlayer materials because we know that in biological materials, for example, in nature, uh, those interfaces are very, uh, they have low stiffness and a low stress, but they are highly deformable in shear deformation. So a lot of energy was dissipated, uh, absorbed, uh, through the shear deformation of this organic interface. So we test a variety of uh, transparent polymer adhesives. Some, some of them are very brittle, so yeah, they, they don't deform quite a lot in shear. And some of them are very strong, so they usually lead to the uh, brittle fracture of glass, glass substrates. So the best choice is the, the thermoplastic elastomer, which is called UVA. And it's very deformable in shear, and it has no stiffness and stress to promote the, the sliding between the building blocks. And it has hardening, which can help the delocalization of the, the, the slidings and the shear deformation. Uh, so at first, we start from some common designs in biological materials, for example, cosplay, polygon, and stagger, which, are, which can be found in a lot of different biological materials. And we implemented those structures into the, the design of the architectural glass panels. And then we have this kind of a continuous ply designs where we have a very, you know, the continuous plies as the basic building blocks. And also we have segmented designs where all the building blocks have finite size, just like what we have in the, in the biological materials. And we find out that for continuous ply designs, and we have a very low, we have a very localized damage, and uh, all the all the building blocks suffers a brittle fracture, so very limited energy was absorbed. And for the segment designs with an adequate size of the building blocks, we can have a very delocalized deformation, and uh, and there's a lot of energy uh, absorbed by the by the interlayer sharing. However, if you have a two, the building blocks too large, then you will lead to a brittle fracture, similar to what we have in the continuous ply designs. So the sweet spot would, would be having an intermediate size of the building blocks. And uh, so that we can have uh, both optimized uh, strength and as well as toughness. The, the problem is uh, the second design is although it improves both strength and toughness, but it adds the cost of a reduced uh, stiffness and comparing to the continuous ply designs. So we know that a lot of biological structures such as most of the seashells, they have uh, two types of structures combined together. Uh, the outer layer will be a prismatic uh, structures which uh, pro provide stiffness strength and then prevent, prevent uh, penetration. And the inner nacreous layers, they, uh, they, they help absorb energies. So here we use uh, combined plan layers and architecture based together into hybrid layers. So the top 
plant layers upon, upon under under puncture. The top plant layers will provide stiffness and strength and to prevent the indenture to penetrate into the materials. And the inner uh, architecture layers will have the function to absorb energy. So here we have a very good result that you can see that uh, comparing to the uh, fully architectured uh, panels, we have a substantially improved stiffness as well as strength. And uh, although the, the top plan layer suffers from brittle fracture, but the uh, architecture layer still can absorb a lot of energy. So we have a simultaneous improvements on the stiffness, strength, and, and toughness. So we want to implement those design principles into uh, develop like impact resistance a nature like a uh, glass. And uh, so to duplicate the large scale, the delocalized tablet sliding we can observe in nature. And the first thing we examine like for glass material specifically, we examine the transparency and due to the highly aligned building blocks, we can see that although the transparency of those kind of nature like glass is only slightly lower than that of the plant laminate glass. I mean, it is lower, but uh, it's uh, slightly lower. And uh, then we're following the design principles, like uh, we have this kind of fully architecture, uh, nature like glass, as well as the hybrid designs. And we find out, and we compare it to the plant laminate glass. We find out that uh, we can actually approach the stiffness and the strength of the plant laminate glass and by the, the, the overall toughness is uh, uh, much higher than the plan laminate glass due to the uh, mechanism it's a uh, triggered tablet sliding. So we further examine which is the dominant um, toughening mechanism in those uh, glass panels and we use micro CT scanning to uh, quantify the sliding distance of each tablet and we find and we, we find out that in, in the nature like glass we can see the uh, the tablet sliding is very delocalized and uh, spread over the whole samples. And uh, well, in the plant laminate glass, we don't have much sliding happening, and there's only very localized uh, cracks. And uh, we compute the energy absorption based on the sliding distance, and we find out that it is roughly it's roughly the same as we can get from the of uh, uh, puncture test, the force and displacement curve from the front uh, of the puncture test, which proves that the large scale tablet sliding is the most dominant toughening mechanisms in those nature like architectural glass. So eventually we trying to uh, implement the mechanism into at, at a high strain rate impact and uh, comparing to other transparent materials. As you can see that uh, although it, at a high strain rate impact, we can still find uh, the, the similar mechanism as we observed in the fancy static test. And there's a lot of heavy sliding and a processing zone surrounding the puncture site. Well, the other uh, transparent materials, uh, no matter it's inorganic or organic, they usually have a very kind of relatively brittle performance and a high strain rate impact. And overall, we have a substantially improved impact resistance comparing to other uh, transparent materials. So that's uh, pretty much conclude my you know, work uh, on this specific topic. And I would like to thank Professor Basarat for his anniversary and my team members, and also uh, help from uh, Professor Bureau of Professor and my committee members, and also all the technicians that helped me on the, some experiments. Yeah, thanks a lot. OK, thank you very much, uh, Zen. That's really interesting. Uh, I mean, you have a great um, uh, manufacturing technique there, isn't it, that allows you to, uh, to, to look at all those different variations on, on, on structure and design, and that's really, yeah. uh, that's really been very useful to you. Yeah, I was going to ask you, and then, I mean, you, you put up those high strain rate uh, impact, impact results there just right at the end. Obviously, with that elastomeric material, basically rubber type material, yeah, uh, that, that, would, that would have very big strain rate sensitivity, wouldn't it? So you would expect to, to get different behavior at different uh, strain uh, rates. Have, have, uh, are you able to kind of quantify how the behavior changes with strain rate? Yeah, we actually, uh, we compare the, the performance, the strain force differential curve of the high strain, under the high strain rate to the static one. And indeed, like the performance is a little, 
in terms of the performance, it's a bit different. So at crisis static, uh, the material tends to be more deformable than at the high strain rate. But the high strain rate, the product is like is less deformable, but the strength is getting higher because the polymer we are using is quite uh, strain rate sensitive. So they, they will you know, behave more stiffer, behave stiffer at the high strain rates. I think that's the, 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 the reason for that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. back to uh, to Peter Zupos and the effects of the uh, of the soft stuff in yeah. the boat. Similar yeah. question, yeah, really. Uh, any other questions, or if, if other panel members would like to speak, please do. Uh, not seeing any more questions coming in just now. Okay. Yeah, I don't see. <clears throat> I don't see any questions. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe that's uh, that, that this time to to wind it up. I think it's you know it's been we've had three fascinating talks there. Lovely range of materials. Nice to see some great new work as well as some you know interesting historical comments and anecdotal comments about John. So uh, just sorry that he's not here to listen to it. But hey, there you go. Uh, so uh, Marcus, maybe I'll just pass back to you for any any final uh, remarks. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. And thank you, uh, other speakers. This was really tremendous. Um, and we got some great comments um, and questions and discussion. And we went over a little bit, but that was predicted and um, desirable. So um, thank you all for sticking it out. Um, I will be posting the final full recording on YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, I'll be announcing that through Twitter, probably, and as well through the email list. Um, in the meantime, stay tuned for the next JMBBM Frontiers webinar, which will be happening sometime in December. Um, and uh, we have a couple of more scheduled already into the next year. So stay tuned on this. If you're interested in hosting a webinar, um, this is an invitation to the community. Um, get in touch with me um, at mbuller at mit.edu. And uh, we can talk about the details and logistics of that. With that, um, thank you. Big thank you to David, uh, Claudia, Peter, Jen, um, and um, thank you, uh, John, for, you, for the inspiration. Uh, you know, you, you're not listening right now, but um, I think you've inspired many, many of us. And I think it's a tremendous impact you've had on, on our lives. So thank you very much for that. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.